Ngayon umaga po sa ating lahat. Salamat sa pagdalo ninyo sa aming panambahan. This Sunday, we begin a new series on governance. Ang ating pong pagbubulay-bulay sa umaga ito will start off this series. I have entitled this sermon as Governance as a Mandate. Sapagkat kailangan po nating maintindihan na ang governance ay hindi lamang tungkol sa politika, kundi sa lahat ng mga kailangan nating pamamahala sa ating mga pamilya, sa ating mga negosyo, sa ating mga korporasyon, mga institusyon, at uh, ganun din po sa gobyerno at iba pa. Kaya ngayon po, mahalaga na maintindihan natin kung ano yung governance at anong nilalaman ng mandate na ito para sa atin at hindi lamang sa church kundi sa buong kamunduhan. So, we will start with understanding yung governance as part of the cultural mandate. So, when we are thinking governance, we usually just think of politics. Governance in scripture is much, much bigger. It means dominion over all of creation. In fact, over all of our social life. Uh, yung pong word na dominion actually also means rulership. No? We have been given the image of God so that we may rule. Yung po ang unang ibig sabihin ng cultural mandate. A major reason why societies suffer is bad governance. Kagaya po ng Pilipinas, walang reason kung bakit tayo ay maging mahirap. We have, sabi ng mga development theories, ang mga nations daw become poor because of certain deficits. Deficit sa natural resources, deficit sa human resource, hindi ulang masyadong mga pinag-aralan ang human resource, deficit sa, sa capital, deficit sa technology. Na wala po tayong ganong mga deficit. Ang deficit po natin is good governance. So, lahat, ang governance natin is very, very bad. Kaya po, hindi tayo makausad bilang isang bansa. So, it is important that we understand what it means to do good governance, whether in families, in churches, in corporations, government, and other institutions. In Genesis 1, 26 to 28, we are given the first ever commandment. Yung tinatawag po na cultural mandate. What does this mean? for our societies. Now, ito pong image of God was given to us precisely so that we can govern. We are actually God's image in the world. Ito po ang sabi nung tayo ay nilikha. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Now, in the ancient world, sinasabi, only the kings are said to bear the divine image. Hindi po yung lahat ng sangkatauhan. Yun lamang pong mga king. Yun lamang nasa otoridad. Their statues and images in coins are to represent their presence in remote corners of the empire. Yung pong panahon ng Roman Empire, halimbawa, they have all these far-flung territories. At para daw, kunyari, ando doon yung presence ng emperor, meron pong mga statue sa mga lugar na yun. Para i-remind sila na present ang emperador sa mga lugar na kahit na napaka-remote, ando doon siya. Kaya po, yun po ay mga images, no? whether it is in coin or mga statue. Now, scripture tells us na hindi lamang po yung mga kings o mga emperor ang made in the divine image. Lahat ng tao. Scripture has a very high view of all human beings. We all have the stamp of God's image and we represent Him on earth. Now, when we're thinking image, 
We usually locate the meaning of the image of God in our intellectual or reasoning faculties. Pero sa context po ng ating scripture in this passage, the image is primarily what it takes to exercise dominion or rulership. It is a very strong verb, rada, to trample in Hebrew. And likewise, to unsa verse 28, pag sabi na, go forth, multiply, and have dominion, ang um, sabi po ito ay kabas, meaning to tread down. Kailangan po ng effort, ganyan. Even before the fall, kaya sabi, the human exercise of rulership is not effortless like that of God's. Now, yung pong Genesis 1 verse 28, yung tinatawag na cultural mandate, has two full task. One is growth. The other is governance. Sabi, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Yan po yung growth, no? And sabi, subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Nakakalimutan po natin na together with the growth should be governance. Dahil sabi, be fruitful, multiply, no? Pero sabi, have dominion over all of creation. Ano po ibig sabihin nito? Well, it means, first of all, that we cannot grow more than we can actually govern. Yung growth should be proportionate to our capacity to manage or to govern. We must respect the limits of the created order. Alam po nyo, meron po akong uh, kaibigan sa isang urban poor church. Uh, very entrepreneurial siya, mausay siya sa negosyo. Meron siyang bigasan, meron siyang mga nag-loan siya para, tinulungan ko siya para mag-loan para sa isang jeepney. Ngayon, nung ako'y nag-abroad ng mga two or three weeks, pagbalik ko, ba tatlo na yung jeepney niya? So sabi ko, mababayaran mo ba yan? Ay, oo, oh, madali lang po yan. Meron akong bigasan, etc. Pero, nang mag-abroad uli ako after six months, mamalik ako, aba, nawala na po yung mga jeep. Sabi ko, anong nangyari? Eh kasi pala, mabilisan siya na, in other words, nag siya more than she can un actually manage yung kanyang business. So, mahalaga po na while we must grow, there is something wrong kapag tayo ay hindi nagmumultiply, hindi nag-grow, no? Pero there is also something wrong kapag tayo ay nag-grow more than we can actually manage. In other words, we have to respect yung limits, no? Of what we can and cannot do. And ito pong limits sa ito will include our limits as people. Our limits as organizations. One of the things I have learned recently is that as leader of an organization, I'm actually a steward of the organization's energies. In other words, just because ako, uh, kahit na matanda na ako, uh, marami pa akong energy and marami pa akong project. And hindi ko na-realize na yung aking mga staff do not have the same level of energy. Kaya nagre-reklamo na sila in a burnout. I think it is important that we steward carefully also our limits as people. Hanggang dito na lamang po ako at maraming salamat, no? In other words, kung kaya mo, kayanin mo, pero kung hindi mo kaya, hanggang dito na lamang. And, and it is okay because those are the limits of what we can and cannot do. And so, the same with organizations, lalo na kung tayo ay mga leader, we are to steward carefully yung energy ng mga tao that we govern. And as families, ganun din po. We cannot grow more children than we can actually feed and nurture. Akala po natin ito pong go forth and multiply. Eh, ibig sabihin, eh, magparami lang tayo ng mga anak. Hindi po lang yun ang ibig sabihin. Kasi merong sinasabi na while you grow, you also govern, you also rule. So, we do not grow more children than we can actually feed and nurture and grow them into... Uh, 
human beings that have all the care that they need. Ganon din po ang mga churches. We are not to put into office leaders. Halimbawa raw, sabi ni, ni Paul sa Timothy, we cannot put into office leaders who cannot manage their own households, who cannot manage their own children. Bakit po, sabi, eh, if they cannot rule their own households, paano pa, how can they rule a whole church? Uh, Mahigpit po na inulit-ulit ito para sa mga leaders as deacons and leaders as elders. Na we cannot uh, put into office people who cannot manage their own families, their own children, their own households. So kailangan po tinitingnan natin ito. At kung meron man tayong mga kandidato para sa, sa presidente, dapat tinitingnan natin anong klaseng mga anak meron sila. Paano sila lumaki? No? Sila ba ay mga spoil, mga drug addict? Sila ba ay marunong uh, murumes peto? No? Hindi lang sa kanilang mga magulang, kundi sa established order sa society. So, dapat tinitingnan po natin yung kanilang mga pamilya. If the families are managed well. So, importante po yun. Now, as societies also, we must see to it that the rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Ang, ang mga rulers daw po, according to Romans 13, are servants of God. And the state wields the sword to carry out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Unfortunately, pag iniisip natin yung Romans 13, akala natin ang sinasabi lang nito be subject to governing authorities. Hindi, hindi lang po yun. Binibigyan tayo ng reason kung bakit we must be subject. Dahil the state daw, yung mga rulers, are there. So that they should punish those no, who do wrong and to praise those who do right. We find that sa 1 Peter 2, no, sabi, uh, it is our responsibility na, na ang governance punishes those who do evil and praises those who do good. The main function, by the way, of government is justice. Ito po ang kanyang mandate sa Panginoon. Kapag ang gobyerno ay hindi maaasahan na to punish those who do wrong and to praise those who do right, nawawalan po siya ng legitimacy to rule. Ito po ang nagpapalakas ng kanyang authority. Kapag ang gobyerno really executes Justice. Yung po ang kanyang core business. Justice. They are to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Mahirap po yung baliktad, no? Uh, binibigyan pa po ng bagong posisyon, incentive, yung mga nagwala sa gobyerno. Pagkatapos yung mga talagang gumagawa, mga civil servants who very humbly and responsibly perform their duties, madali silang palampatalsikin. You know? In other words, pagka ganun po, kailangan tinatanong natin, may legitimate authority pa ba ang gobyerno to? So we need to ask that. And in a democracy, meron po tayong power no? na ilagak ang isang pinuno at may power din tayo to overthrow him. No? Huwag nang iboto. So, yun po ang power ng mga citizens in a republic. And it is our duty that governance is such that it is something that executes justice, punishes those who do evil. Alimbawa, pag nag-iisip po tayo ngayong mga panahon, ang gobyerno po ba natin ay talaga nagpapanish, No? ng mga masasama. Ang nangyayari, eh, binibigyan pa po ng mga posisyon yung mga umaabuso sa kanilang mga otoridad. So, importante po na maisip natin ito. Ano ang dapat natin gawin? Ano ang responsibility natin bilang mga citizens in a republic, in a democracy? Meron po tayong power to vote. Ang power to vote po ay napaka-importante sapagkat yan po ang nagsasabi, no? ayaw ko na sa iyo, and kailangan ng palitan. Because you are not what doing, 
your core function, which is justice. Hindi po revolusyon ang sagot. Ang, re ang sagot, bumoto ng gusto. Para sa isang gobyerno, who will punish those who do evil and who will praise those who do good. And by the way, ang good governance po, kailangan sa lahat ng institution, this is for all institutions, we are all to be obedient to the cultural mandate. Now, but there is more than just obedience, no? Uh, and good governance sa mga institusyon. Uh, ito po ay yung mas malaki, mas malawak na responsibilidad. Yun po yung care for creation. Maalala po natin sa Genesis 2, no? Nilagay si Adam para daw, parang garden daw to till it and to keep it, no? Now, it is unfortunate that we mostly have a theology of salvation, yung tinatawag na soteriology. And we have little theology about creation, no? Um, kay, halimbawa, sabi dun sa Genesis 1.28, you must fill the earth. Ano po ibig sabihin nito? It means that we produce out of the raw material that God has given to us. Artifacts that speak of the creative image of God in us. Uh, um, ang Diyos po, nung gumawa siya ng heaven and earth and so on, nung nag-create siya, it was creation in the raw. Binigyan po niya ng responsibilidad ang tao para pagyamanin itong creation in the raw. No? In other words, in our interaction with the environment, we create culture, we create artifacts that will make our life livable. No? Part yan ng image of God. So, alimbawa, yung discoveries of science, yung mga vaccines, yung mga kung ano-ano na nilalabas ngayon out of scientific knowledge, that is obedience to the creative mandate ng Genesis 1.28. Yung mga artists, no? yung mga colors of the natural world, very, very focused yung attention nila doon. Then they make it into art. And in other words, all the human enterprise that we call culture. At ito po ay obedience to the cultural mandate. Part ito po ng ating governance at pagpapayaman ng raw creation that God has given to us. Kaya po masyadong uh, matindi yung ating sinasuffer kapag we do not care enough for creation and the environment around us. Sabi nga sa Romans 8, Creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Ibig sabihin, yung ecological crisis natin is waiting for the people of God to show up. Yung nagsabi ng revealing, no? Uh, to show up in the face of disasters and environmental threats. Kung ako po ang tatanungin ninyo, masyara tayong disobedient sa cultural mandate, no? Hindi po natin pinagyayaman yung creation because we degrade the environment. Kung ano ang mga pinagagawa natin sa ating likas na yaman na binigay ng Diyos sa atin. Kaya, Palagi tayong merong disaster. We always face environmental vulnerability and so on. So, importante yung care for creation. Part po yan ng cultural mandate. Yung mga experts tell us that in the past 40 years, energy use grew faster than the human population. I quote uh, some of these authors. Sabi, within the lifetime of the generation born today, no? Sa ating henerasyon. The planet would either be terminally ill, sabihin katakusan na, or on a path to sustainable recovery. At sa tingin ko, what will make the difference is our obedience to caring for creation. The church has a primary responsibility to care for creation, to till it, and to keep it. Mandate po yan na directly galing sa Diyos. In such a way that all of nature, all the human beings, animate, inanimate, that inhabit the earth, are able to grow and flourish. Yun po ang ibig sabihin ng dominion. Rulership. 
we most image God when we govern well and imitate the maker in his making. Now, this brings up the role of the church in society. Marami pong maring sabihin dito, but within the limited time that we have, I would like to address a very basic question. What does it mean to say that the church and the state are separate? Marami pong nagsasabi, yung religion daw at saka politics, no, wag ipagsama. They should be separate. Now, in what sense should the state be independent of the church and vice versa? And in what sense is religion meant to invade public life? Now, the separation of church and state as a policy, you know, public policy po ito, arose out of the Puritan pilgrims' experience of persecution in the hands of state-sponsored religions. Ito pong mga pilgrims no na nakasakay doon sa Mayflower doon sa sa New England colonies na nag-sprout no galing sa Europe ito pong mga puritans na to na mga uh, mga pilgrims were actually fleeing yung persecution ng mga countries where they have state sponsored religions halimbawa kung ikaw ay Lutheran sa Germany, yung mga hindi Lutheran, kawawa naman. Yung mga, yung mga Anabaptist, kaya marami Anabaptist sa limbawa sa Amerika, is because they fled yung mga state-sponsored persecution arising from having a state religion. At yun po ang pinagbabawal. Kaya po sa American history, dahil yun ang experience ng mga pilgrims, yung mga, mga, mga migrants no, mula sa Europe, Uh, nilagay nila ito sa kanilang constitution. The church should be separate from the state. Ang ibig lang sabihin po nito, hindi yung huwag kayong makikialam whatsoever, no? Sa mga politika, etc. sa mundo, hindi ganon. Ang ibig po sabihin, there should be tolerance and equal treatment of all religions by the state. Wala dapat tinatawag na state religion. Uh, yun po ang Uh, buod at espiritu ng constitutional uh, guarantee na yon ng religion. Yung tatawag na freedom of religion. In other words, walang dapat magdikta sa atin, no? whether it's the state or anybody, na dapat ganito ang religion ko. Yun ang ibig po sabihin ng separation ng church and state. But we need to realize yung church and state separation is only institutional. In other words, yung church as an institution, eh hindi pwede makialam sa gobyerno. No? Uh, ang ibig po sabihin nito, hindi pwede yung mga kagaya nung sa Russia, merong tinatawag na isang uh, priest, no? si, si, uh, si Rasputin, na kung ano nung nga pinagsasabi, Uh, sa matter of policy, run sa Charist Russia. And sabi nila, it is one of the factors kung bakit na bumulusok yung rule no, ng Char nung panahon. Uh, ano, at finally, nagkaroon ng revolusyon noong 1917 sa Russia. Now, disastrous po kapag uh, ang, ang, ang isang pope, no? ito po yung medieval struggle noong unang panahon, ang isang pope will tell the king how to rule. Hindi po dapat yun. Uh, at yun namang king, wala rin siyang pakialam kung paano gagawin ng mga bishops yung kanilang uh, ecclesiastical affairs. Ito po yung tinatawag ni Abraham Kuyper. Si Abraham Kuyper po ay isang uh, Dutch na <clears throat> politician and also a Dutch philosopher and uh, theologian. Meron po siyang tinatawag na sphere sovereignty. In other words, ang Pope cannot tell the king how to rule and the king may not interfere with church matters. Each is sovereign in their own spheres of competence. May competence yung mga pare, mga pastor, may competence din yung mga civil servants. At hindi dapat yun na nagdidikta sa isa't isa. Ito po ang ibig sabihin ng ng uh, separation ng church and state as institutions. Ngayon, kailangan po maintindihan natin, 
more precisely, what we mean by church dito, no? Yung local institutional church, ang ba kagaya po ng DBC, or GCF, or whatever. Yung local institutional church does not exhaust the meaning of the visible church. Diya tawag na Ecclesia Visibilis. Sabi dito ni Herman Duyward, he's a Dutch philosopher also and theologian, sabi niya, the temporal revelation of the Corpus Christi, in the value of Christ, in its broadest sense, embraces all the social structures of our temporal human existence. Ang ibig sabihin, yung body of Christ, sabi, should show up in all the social structures of society. Hindi lang sa church. Halimbawa, yung mga Christians na mausay sa akademya, eh di, dyan kayo sa mga universities. Yung mga Christians na mausay sa politics, dyan kayo sa politics. Yung mga mahusay sa sa science, o dyan kayo sa science, In, invent all the drugs na kailangan natin. Yung mga mahuhusay na Christians sa law, o dyan kayo sa law. In other words, the body of Christ, no, has to reveal itself. No, sabi, we show up. In all the social structures of our human existence. In other words, and this is the, hindi ito yung local church, this is the visible church. In other words, yung church should be visible sa politics, visible sa economics, visible sa all areas of life, so that they perform yung function ng salt and light in all the institutions that we find in human society. Pero yung church as a church, no, as an institution, should do the preaching of the word, the evangelism, the nurture and care of its members so that six days a week, kapag sila po ay nandudun sa kanilang fields of competence, uh, they really bear witness as salt and light. Yung po, ang gawa ng local church is to empower the body of Christ so that they become salt and light in whatever sphere of society. So, meron po akong diagram dito, no? Uh, yung church as an institution cannot be involved in politicking. Hindi pwede yun. So, but we must understand na yung visible church is bigger than the local church, No? Yung visible church can be visible sa politics, must be visible sa science and technology, sa media. Kaya po marami tayong mga fake news eh. Uh, there are all these areas of life na nag-retreat ang church. 200 years ago, nag-umpisa na na mag-retreat no? ang churches sa mga areas na ito. Politics, science, media, arts, business. Kaya ang nangyari, ngayon ito po, highly secularized na. Lahat ng mga rules and regulations uh, regulating the conduct of politics, of the arts, of science, eh highly secularized na. Uh, wala tayo dun kasi. The visible church is not visible dun sa mga areas na yan. Kaya ganyan ang politics natin. Kaya maraming fake news sa media. Kaya yung arts can become what? Highly anti-God, no? Yung business, hanggang profit lang ang gusto. And so on. Why? Because the church withdrew, the body of Christ withdrew from being salt and light in all of these fields of enterprise. Kaya po, naalala ko, meron akong kaibigan when I was uh, doing research noon sa, sa Yale University through the uh, auspices of the Ministry Study Center. At uh, yung director noon was asking me, uh, what can we do ngayon po na now that, you know, we look like we are an island, no, a little island that is being engulfed by a sea of secularism. Kasi nung panahon po na yun, na nandito na ko, bumaba yung decree, no, doon sa, sa Episcopal na Sinod, na yung kanilang mga ministers should not refuse 
uh, gay couple kung gusto nilang magpakasal, no? Yung same-sex marriage. And of course, malaking controversy ito sa mga churches. And parang sabi ng pastor, ma our hands are tied. Ngayon, yung director ng Overseas Ministry Study Center was was asking me, uh, dahil ako po ay social anthropologist, so he was asking, anong pwedeng gawin para ma-reverse ito? Itong tide ng secularism, no? Sabi sa kanya, alam po nyo, baka it's too late. Kasi for 200 years, ang Western churches have been retreating. We have retreated from politics, we have retreated from the sciences, from the arts, from media, from business. And so, ang ating mga public institutions, public life, uh, has become more and more secular. And actually, has become uh, the dominant uh, institutions that rule over us. Kaya sabi ko, baka po dapat maintindihan natin na in the West, 200 years na po ang movement na ito of secularism. So, kailangan po, bumalik tayo. We become visible as a church, as churches, as Christians. Sa so, mga areas of uh, ano, activity na ito. Kaya sabi nga ni John Stott, ito po yung tinatawag na church is scattered. Yung ecclesia visibilis, the visible church, is not just the church as worship, but the church in the marketplace, in the academy, in politics, etc. This is the church is scattered. As distinct from the church gathered or the ecclesia. Maganda pong distinction na ginawa yan ni John Stott. Tayo pong mga professionals out in the field, no? We are the visible church in all of these fields of endeavor. We are the church scattered. Pero we also gather once a week as the church gathered, yung ecclesia where we are nurtured by the church institution, no? Kaya po sinasabi ko palagi, huwag natin sayangin yung salita ng Diyos every Sunday. Sapagkat ito po nagpapalakas to those of us who have to bear witness sa mundo six days a week. Ito yung church scattered. Pero while we are gathered, sana, the Holy Spirit who guides us into all truth, will help us no, to be empowered from the Word so that we will function truly as the Church of Christ in all of these fields. Yung po ang ibig sabihin. Hindi ibig sabihin eh, yung church institution dapat makialam. Hindi. Tayo, bilang mga anak ng Diyos, makikialam tayo according to our expertise. No, ano po ang implication po nito sa ating araw-araw na buhay? Well, first of all, Governance is everyone's business. Whether you are governing families, organizations, corporations, churches, or government, we must see to it that we are governing, we are tilling and keeping the earth, enhancing all of its possibilities, and seeing to it that the next generation are growing up with structures that are stable. Hindi po yung ang feeling nila any moment magkukulaps ng ekonomiya, any moment magkukulaps na yung ating, ano, we will be a failed state. So gusto na lang mag-migrate kung saan, ano, sa Europe, sa Amerika. We must see to it na ano man ang ating uh, rulership, saan man tayo nangunguna, Meron po tayong responsibilidad to see to it that people are governed in such a way that our societies are stable, our families are stable, our organizations, corporations, and churches are stable so that we can raise the next generation with a deep sense of security. 
at hindi po yung palagi nag-iisip sila na lumabas ng bansa sapagat any moment baka kung anong mangyari dito. So, importante po yung governance. It's everyone's business. Also, all have a calling to make a difference in the world. Sabi sa 1 Corinthians, no, that great passage about gifts, sabi, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Ito po yung language ng common good ngayon, ano, na lahat tayo binigyan ng kaloob at lahat tayo merong banal na spirito so that we can manifest this. Pwede po natin ipakita, no, for the sake of the common good. Hindi po tayo binigyan ng mga kaloob para sa atin lamang. Ito pong kaloob na ito ay para for the common good. Makikita po natin yan sa 1 Corinthians 12.7. Hindi po natin pwedeng sabihin, ay anong magagawa ako? O eh, ako eh, mahirap lang. O ako eh, civil servant lang. O ako eh, nanay lang. Ganon, ganon. Hindi po. If we are governing our families well, we will have less broken families. Uh, if we are keeping our promises to each other, pag nado na tayo sa altar, no? Naalala ko po yung isang pare uh, when I was attending uh, yung isang kasal. And they were making their vows na, no? Or yung sinasabi na, I shall love you, richer or poorer, ganun ganon. Sabi nung pare, this is about the strongest promise you will ever do. The strongest thing you will ever do as human beings is to keep this promise that you will be together till death do us part. Dahil sabi niya, pag kayo ay naghiwalay and you do not honor your promises to each other. Pag meron ng mga broken homes and broken families, society also gets broken. Kaya po siguro ganito ang ating bansa. Dahil nagkawatak-watak na ang ating mga pamilya. You have na no parent or one parent na mga households. Yung mga bata lumalaki, walang governance. Walang direction. Ngayon, ito eh, for the common good. Akala natin, parent lang ako, nanay lang ako, tatay lang ako. No. Meron po tayong uh, responsibility to govern our families in such a way that we keep our promises unang-una sa isa't isa so that the family does not get broken. Sabi po nung pare na ito, sabi niya, I have seen so many wayward children. At pag tinignan mong background nila, 70% come from broken homes. Society will break down when the families break down. Lack of governance. At ganun din po, yung mga korporasyon na walang budhi, no? walang konsyensya. Ganun din yung gobyerno. Massive ang corruption. In a time na nagkakahirap ang mga tao, nagkakagutom. Bilyones ang mga ninanakaw sa coffers ng ating gobyerno. So, ito po ang importante, no? Kahit po tayong mga Kristiyano, we are given the responsibility to manifest the Spirit for the common good. At ang isa pa po, political participation is not just putting Christians into office, but transforming the use of power according to God's purposes. Akala po natin, tayo ay nag-participate na kapag meron tayong kandidato na gusto nating maging presidente. Hindi po yun ang major na intent or what it means to participate politically. Ito po ang sabi ng isang ano, thinker in relation to this. Sabi niya, Christian political life is not the accepted political life of the time being accomplished by Christian individuals. It is doing the will of God as revealed in the Holy Scriptures in the political sphere of human society. In other words, putting Christians into office may or may not do good. Marami na po tayong mga born again ngayon na nasa Senado at lahat 
Pero pag tinitingnan mo yung kanilang track record, wala namang pagkakristyano. Wala namang difference yung pagkakristyano doon sa mga actuations nila bilang mga public officials. In other words, political participation is not just putting Christians into office. Sabi, we have to see to it that the will of God as revealed in Scripture is being done in the political sphere of human life. And it doesn't matter kung halimbawa, hindi naman sila mga Kristiyano, hindi sila mga born again, pero they are people who are for the common good. Hindi sila nagnanakaw, disente sila. In other words, they may not be uh, professing Christians, but they may be people who hold kingdom values. And those people are worth uh, voting into office. Tatanungin natin, are these people people of kingdom values? Eh, minsan, kahit kristyano ka, born again ka, wala namang kingdom values na nakikita in the way you do politics. No? So, magtalang may mga tao na hindi naman sila nagsasabi kami, born again, and yet have a very passionate concern for justice. Passionate concern for the poor. At maayos ang kanilang pamumuno. So, yun po ang dapat natin iboto. Ngayon, we are living in a time of fake news, no? So, importante po na tayong mga Kristiyano should fight for truth in the public square. We now live in shadows. Ito po yung term ni Jacques Ellul, no? Sabi niya, in a technologically mediated environment, sabi niya, we live in shadows. In other words, what you know as true is actually something na napick up mo lang sa social media o sa newspaper o kung saan. It is not really something that you have lived, no? It is not a lived experience, kundi you have just absorbed all of this information dyan sa mga social environment mo. In other words, these are shadows, sabi nga ni Jacques Lou. Now, in a time ng maraming shallowy ng mga fake news, so, paano natin madidiscern, no? Uh, sabi nga ni Charles Budler a long time ago in his poem, sabi niya, the truth is evil comes up softly like a flower. Alam po niyo si Satan. At first glance, no? At first instance, comes to you very charming, very seductive, no? Oo, oh, okay naman pala itong si ganito eh. Ah, hindi naman yan magnanakaw kasi guwapo, etc. You know, evil comes up softly like a flower. Kahit itong French poet na si Charles Budler, hindi naman siya Kristiyano, pero naintindihan niya yun. Evil does not come to you in an ugly way. Kaya nga tayo ay nabubuyo sapagkat charming, sapagkat seductive, no? It shows its ugly face only afterwards pag hawak-hawak ka na niya. Ganun po ang nature ng evil. So, importante that we wage as Christians no, yung this battle of narratives. Uh, especially those of you with uh, gifts in the area of writing, media, arts, ganyan. We must make every thought captive to obey Christ. Ito po ang ating calling. Those of you who are good with words, those of you good with pictures, good with uh, any kind of artistic thing, anything that speaks to the consciousness of people. Yung mga teachers, ganyan. We must make every thought captive to obey Christ. Dahil, whether we like it or not, we are waging a war. And this war has to do with hearts and minds, no? We are waging uh, a war for the hearts and minds of people. Hindi lang yung mga kandidato. Tayo mismo. Dahil sa panahon na ito, we now live in shadows. Hindi mo na alam. Everything is confused, uncertain. Sino ba ang tama at sino totoo? Dahil paray propaganda ang nakikita mo. Paray fake news ang nakikita mo. So it is important to discern exactly how evil comes up softly like a flower. At ito po ay trabaho natin 
bilang mga anak ng Diyos. Hindi lamang sa panahong ito, kundi for all time. Sabi ni Pablo, ito po yung ating trabaho to make every thought captive to obey Christ. Yung mga ideas around us, no? uh, kung ano-anong mga naririnig natin, uh, we must discern whether it is evil or it is for the common good. Now, let me end with an encouragement. <clears throat> the kingdom, when it advances, is often a movement of the small. Pero huwag tayong magkamali, it is powerful. Meron pong uh, study, si Robert Bella, who is a sociologist sa University of California sa Berkeley. Gumawa po siya ng study ng mga Japanese sa Japan na Christians. Now, yung mga Japanese at Christians, wala nga 1%, point zero something pa nga yata ngayon. Wala nga 1% yan. Uh, and yet, sabi niya, he was impressed by this small minority of Christians and the way they have impacted Japanese society as a whole. Ito po ang kanyang ulat. Si Robert Bella po, hindi naman Christian. Sabi niya, we should not underestimate the significance of the small group of people who have a vision of a just and gentle world. In Japan, a very small minority of Protestant Christians introduced ethics into politics and had an impact beyond all proportion to their numbers. They were central in the beginnings of the women's movement, labor unions, and virtually every reform movement. The quality of a culture may be changed when 2% of its people have a new vision. 2% lang po, according to Robert Pella. Yung mga social historians po sa Europe, say sa England, sinasabi nila, kailangan mo lang 5%, no? To turn things around. 5% lang ng population. Eh ngayon po, dito sa Pilipinas, hindi lang tayo 5%. The latest global survey that I have seen sabi ko kung i-aggregate mo yung mga protestant ni yung Pentecostals no? like yung mga charismatic movements sa mga protestante and the renewal movements sa mga catholic sabi niya easily 44% of the population profess to be renewed Christians or born again Christians ang dami po Now, what are we doing? 44%. And yet, yung level of corruption sa Pilipinas is one of the highest dito sa Southeast Asia. Sa Japan, if you commit a crime, 80% of the time you are likely to get caught and punished kahit na ikaw ay prime minister. Dito, Walang malaki, walang big fish, no? Na nahuli na, na bigyan niya ng sentensya, na nabilanggo and punish. Yung mga napapanish ay yung mga maliliit na kagaya nitong si Mang Narding, no? Si Lolo Narding, na nag-steal daw ng oh, 10 kilos ng mangos. And for this, he was jailed. And yet we have big politicians na nagraran pa sa Congress, nagraran pa sa Senado, who actually have been convicted of plunder. Ano nangyari sa ating Kristyanismo? Why is it that even if we have 44% of professing Christians, whether renewed or born again, This has not translated itself into justice and righteousness in our society. Ito po ang aking dalangin sana 
na matagal ko nang kinahihintay. Na yung sinasabing church growth ng Pilipinas will mean something will be socially significant in bringing justice to the poor in our land. Manalangin po tayo. Panginoon, kami po ay humingi ng tawad sa inyo. Nang na aming pananampalataya ay hindi nagbubunga ng justice at righteousness sa aming bansa. Forgive us. Forgive us din po sa aming disobedience sa cultural mandate. Hindi namin pinagyayaman ang aming kapaligiran at bagkos ito po ay nadidegrade at nakabuso ng mga maraming mga kawatan. Yanalain din po namin ang inyong patawad na hindi po kami nakikialam sa mga bagay na tingin namin labas ako dyan. Teach us, Lord, what it means to do good governance sa aming mga pamilya, sa aming mga organisasyon, sa aming mga negosyo, at sa lahat po ng mga institusyon na tinatawag ninyo kami bilang mga governors o mamamahala. Lord, forgive us for our lack of stewardship, for our lack of good governance sa maraming bagay. Tulungan po ninyo kami na tunay na maging obedient sa inyo sa lahat ng mga pinagagawa niyo sa amin. What it means to truly rule over the creation that you have given to us. Niyanlain po namin ang aming mga simbahan that we will be those who will make accountable yung mga opisyalis namin, yung mga namamahala sa amin. We pray, Lord Jesus, that in your mercy, you shall teach us to discern what is evil and what is good. At iboto lamang po yung mga kandidato na sadyang gagawa ng mabuti ayon sa inyong salita. Ito po ang aming dalangin sa aming bansa. Sa panahon po na ito na kami naharap sa very critical na election. Help us to be discerning. Help us to make the right choices. Ito po ang aming dalangin sa ngalan ng aming Panginoong Jesus at ng aming mahal na Ama at sa kapangyarihan ng Banal na Spirito. Amen.